We all know that Muhammad is considered by many critics a pedophile for marrying a six-year-old child, Aisha. But was Aisha the only kid that Muhammad sexually abused? There are historical evidences that prove otherwise. So if you want to know which other kids Muhammad molested, stay with us, because it's coming up. One of these kids was Ali bin Abi Talib, the cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, and the fourth caliph of Islam, and is the first Imam of Shia Muslims. He was only 10 years old when he embraced Islam, while Muhammad was 40 years old. He married Muhammad's daughter, Fatima, and became his close companion and deputy. Based on most historic records, Fatima was only 9 years old at the time of the wedding while Ali was 22. He participated in many battles and expeditions to help Muhammad gain power and dominance over the Arabian Peninsula, and he was an effective mercenary for Muhammad. In one instance, Ali and Zubair, another companion of Muhammad, killed 700 male members of Banu Quraiza, a Jewish tribe that had betrayed Muhammad and sided with his enemies. We talked about this massacre in this clip. He was also the main executioner of Muhammad after the conquest of Mecca, killing eight of the ten people whom Muhammad ordered to be executed for their opposition to him. We also talked about this bloodshed in this clip. How did Ali become this violent and cold-blooded killer? The science of psychology has shown that we have to seek the origins and reasons for the wickedness of a person in his childhood. He was the son of Abu Talib, the uncle and guardian of Muhammad who had lost his father before he was born. Ali grew up in the same household as Muhammad and formed a strong bond with him. After the death of Abu Talib, Muhammad, who was 30 years older than Ali, practically became Ali's second father and he took Ali under his protection. However, let's see how Ali describes his childhood experience with Muhammad. In his sermon 192, recorded in the book Nahj al-Balaba, or the Peak of Eloquence, as a part of his attempt to emphasize his closeness to Muhammad, to legitimize his caliphate or Muhammad's succession, Ali also talks about his childhood memories with Muhammad. You know my position in relation to the Messenger of God, my close kinship and special status. He placed me on his lap while I was a kid, and he held me close to his chest. He would envelop me in his bed, and his body would touch me, letting me smell his scent, and he would chew something and then feed it to me. And there's nothing wrong with this act. What do you think of this statement? Do you think this is a normal and healthy way for a grown man to treat a young boy? Do you think this is a sign of love and affection or of abuse and manipulation? Do you think this is how a prophet of God should behave or how a pedophile should behave? Some Muslim apologists, especially the Shia ones, try to justify this act by changing the word walad, meaning a kid, to walid, meaning a newborn. But I still don't understand how they want to justify chewing something and then feeding it to a newborn. This childhood experience can easily explain Ali's abnormal behavior when he grew up. He was not only always on a mission to kill, but he was always the one volunteering to flood the people whose crime was something as simple as drinking wine. For example, he whipped Walid ibn Uqba, the governor of Kufa, for drinking wine and neglecting the prayers. He also flogged Abdullah ibn Abbas, his cousin and a prominent companion of Muhammad, for drinking wine. According to some sources, he even flogged his own son, Hassan, for drinking wine. These practices are still common in some Islamic countries, where people are oppressed and punished by the laws of Sharia which are based on the teachings and examples of Muhammad and his family in addition to the Quran. It's obvious that some Sunni Muslims would doubt the authenticity of the Peak of Eloquence simply because it was compiled by a Shiite scholar named Asharif Aradi. 
they may claim that the book lacks a proper chain of narration and that it is a fabrication and blah blah blah. We don't want to just point out how unbiased and reputable scholars such as Toshihiko Izutsu, a Japanese scholar of Islamic philosophy, and Louis Massignon, a French scholar of Islam and mysticism, used the peak of eloquence as their sources to write the books on Islamic teachings and mysticism. But we also want to highlight the work of Sarwar and Muhammad, two academic researchers at the University of Wolverhampton, who recently used computational methods, mainly stelemetric analysis and machine learning, to examine the authenticity of the peak of eloquence by analyzing the morphological segmentation of its text. They compared the book against the works of Aradi and his brother, Sharif al-Murtada, and concluded that the book is internally consistent, which suggests that it can be attributed to a single author. They also concluded that the book was not authored by Aradi or his brother, as some Sunnis have alleged. The authors thus confirm that the content of the Peak of Eloquence can indeed be attributed to Ali. Are you tired of the divisions fueled by nationalism and religious bigotry? If you are yearning for a world that embraces unity and peace, consider supporting our channel by buying us a coffee. As this channel dares to question sensitive but problematic issues, it may never get monetized. Your contribution empowers us to challenge prejudice, bridge gaps, and promote understanding. Well, if you think that incident was disturbing and inappropriate, wait until you hear how Muhammad treated his own daughter, Fatima, the wife of Ali. Fatima was the youngest and most beloved daughter of Muhammad and he often expressed his affection for her in public. However, some of his actions and words towards her were way too affectionate and might have come out as awkward or even creepy. For example, there are many hadiths that report that Muhammad used to kiss Fatima in her mouth and put his tongue in her mouth. One of these hadiths is narrated by Aisha the wife of Muhammad, who said, I saw the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, kissing Fatima in her mouth and putting his tongue in her mouth. Another hadith that is very similar to the previous one, and that is also reported by various Sunni and Shia scholars, says, The Prophet, peace be upon him, would not sleep at night until he placed his face between the breasts of Fatima. On the screen, you will see the screenshots of the pages where we found the Arabic text of this hadith and a list of references with volume, page, and hadith numbers. What do you think of these hadiths? Do you think this is a normal and healthy way for a father to treat his daughter? Do you think this is a sign of love and affection or of incest and perversion? Let me know in the comments. Hey, by the way, if you guys liked what you had so far, please support us by liking and sharing this video. This will also help more people to receive this awareness and help you to get suggested more similar videos on YouTube. Especially, I ask you for a favor to like the video because so many radical Muslims often attack this channel by disliking its videos to prevent YouTube from spreading its clips. Some Muslims might try to defend these hadiths by saying that they are weak and fabricated and that they are not found in the most authentic sources of hadith, such as Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. However, this is not a valid argument because these hadiths are reported by many reputable scholars and narrators and they are found in various reliable sources reported by different chains of narrators. Interestingly, some Sunnis reject these hadiths only on the basis that they were fabricated by Shias to elevate the position of Ali's wife in the eyes of Muslims. And some Shias deny them based on the fact that this hadith was first told by Aisha claiming that she was jealous of Fatima, so she made that up. Yet they both reported them in their hadith books. Moreover, these hadiths are not isolated incidents, but they're part of a pattern of behavior that Muhammad displayed towards Ali, Fatima, and even their sons throughout his life. For example, there are many hadiths that report that Muhammad used to suck on the tongue or the lips of Hussein, and he would say that this was a way of blessing him and protecting him from the fire of hell. 
one of these hadiths is narrated by Anas bin Malik, a companion of Muhammad, who said, I saw the Messenger of Allah sucking on the tongue or the lips of Hussein bin Ali, and he said, No tongue or lips that the Prophet sucked on will be tormented. Another hadith is narrated by Abu Huraira, another companion of Muhammad, who said, The Messenger of Allah came out with Al Hussein bin Ali, and he put him on his lap, and he opened his mouth, and he sucked on his tongue. And then he said, O oh Allah, I love him, so love him and love those who love him. Some Muslims might try to defend these hadiths by saying that they are a sign of Muhammad's love and mercy for Hussein, and that they are a way of transferring his saliva, which is assumed to be a source of blessing and healing, to his grandson. What do you think of these hadiths? Do you think this is a normal and healthy way for a grandfather to treat his grandson? Wouldn't it be awkward and disturbing if you saw your father or grandpa do such a thing to their grandsons? Let us know in the comments. To this day, unfortunately, there have been some reports of pedophilia and homosexuality even among the religious clerics and their students, even during, before or after their Quran teaching sessions. Even Rumi has a verse in which he explicitly criticizes these types of sexualities and some traditions that used to be common in some sophistic monasteries at his era. In the end, I leave the conclusion to you guys. But don't browse away just yet, as we found a couple of more strange hadiths about other abnormal practices through which Muhammad had expressed his affections toward his grandsons. You're watching these hadiths on the screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also feel free to suggest topics for our next video. Peace out. Till later. <laughs> أنا بيكفيني بيكفيني ربيع إيدي وما بدي فلتة من إيدي شو يعني ربيع على إيدك؟ إنه بيكفي إنه أنا داير عليها ودير بالي عليها وحظة وحظتني متفقين مع بعض يعني على كل شيء السؤال تاني الزواج في علاقة بين رجل ومرأة هو تناغم فكري تناغم عاطفي ولكن أيضا علاقة جسدية وتناغم وإنجذاب جسدي شو اللي جذبك بطفل قاصر عمره عشر سنوات؟ أنا برجع بقول لك قلت لك وحرجع أقول لك حبيتها وطلبتها من أبوها لانه انا اتخذ من بنك النجيل هلا كلما ما دخل بعقل